Since culture is such a broad concept, it's more easily grasped if we break it down into its constituent parts. Sociologists conceive of culture as consisting of two major categories, material culture and symbolic culture. Material culture is any physical object to which we give social meaning, art and artifacts, tools and utensils, machines and weapons, clothing and furniture, buildings and toys. The list is immense. Any physical thing that people create, use, or appreciate might be considered material culture. And examining material culture can tell us a great deal about a particular group or society. Just look around you, whether in your bedroom, a library, a coffee house, or a park. There should be many items that you can identify as belonging to material culture. Start with your own clothes and accessories and then extend your observations to your surroundings. The entire room, the building, the landscaping, the street, the neighborhood, community, and further outward. For instance, a designer label on a woman's purse might convey that she follows the current fashion trends. Or the athletic logo on a man's t-shirt might tell us that he's into skateboarding or basketball. Likewise, the carpeting, light fixtures, furniture, and artwork in a building can tell us something about the people who live or work there. And the sports arenas, modes of transportation, historical monuments, and even city dumps reveal the characteristics of a community. Perhaps the proliferation of drive through fast food restaurants in practically every corner of the United States says something about American tastes and lifestyles. We spend more time on the road, we cook fewer meals at home, and prefer the ease and predictability of knowing what we're going to get every time we pull up to our favorite chain. If you were visiting another country, you might see some very different items of material culture. Studying the significance of material culture is like going on an archaeological dig, but instead of learning about the past, you're learning about the present. So let's take as an example a sociological dig in Santa Barbara, California. Local leaders there have been active in preserving the image of the city, particularly in its downtown historical area. The original mission, Presidio, which is a military post, courthouse, and other landmarks built by the early Spanish settlers are still intact. And although the town has grown up around these buildings, zoning regulations require that new construction fit with the distinctive Mediterranean architecture of the Red Tile Roof District. The size and design are restricted, as are the use of signs, lighting, paint, and landscaping. So the newly built grocery store with its textured stucco walls, tile murals, and arched porticos may be difficult to distinguish from the century-old post office a few blocks away. By studying its material culture, we can see how Santa Barbara manages to preserve its history and heritage and successfully resist the pressures of encroaching urban development. The distinctive old California look and feel of the city is perhaps its greatest charm, something that appeals to locals and a steady flock of tourists alike. Non-material or symbolic culture reflects the ideas and beliefs of a group of people. It can be something as specific as a certain rule or custom, such as driving on the right side of the road in the United States and the left side of the road in the United Kingdom. It can also be a broad social system, such as democracy or large-scale social patterns such as marriage. Because symbolic culture is so important to social life, we're going to look at some of its main components. One of the most important functions of symbolic culture is to allow us to communicate through signs, gestures, and language. These form the basis of social interaction and are the foundation of culture. Signs or symbols, such as traffic signals, price tags, notes on sheet music, or product logos have all been designed to meaningfully represent something else. They all convey information. Numbers and letters are the most common signs, but you're probably familiar with lots of other graphic symbols indicating, for instance, which is the men's or women's restroom or whether it's unisex, where the elevator is going, how to pause the video you're watching, or in which lane you should be driving. While we can easily take for granted the meaning of most symbols, others we may have to learn when we first encounter them. Some symbols may be nearly universal, while others may be particular to a given culture. It may take some interpretive work to understand what a sign means if you're unfamiliar with the context in which it's displayed. Take emojis, for instance, those cute or devious little expressions that we can add to our text messages and social media posts. Originally developed in Japan, where the word emoji means pictograph, these symbols have become ubiquitous around the world. Over 1,000 emojis are now recognized as a part of the Unicode standard for computing, and more are being added every year. 
Recently, the human emojis, or emoticons, were modified so that you could choose among a range of skin tones and hair colors in an attempt to better represent our diversity. Although widely used, not every emoji is understood in the same way by all people. The sleepy face emoji is one of the most confusing because it has a water drop between the eyes and the mouth. So most people think it's crying, but in fact that's not a tear, but rather a droplet of drool, which is supposed to indicate sleeping. Gestures are signs made with the body, clapping, nodding, smiling, or any number of facial expressions. Sometimes these acts are referred to as body language or nonverbal communication, since they don't require any words. Gestures can be as subtle as, no as a knowing glance or as obvious as a raised fist. Most of the time, we can assume that other people will get what we're trying to say with our gestures. But while gestures might seem natural and universal, just a matter of common sense, few of them besides those that represent basic emotions are innate. Most have to be learned. For instance, the thumbs up sign, which is associated with praise or approval in the United States, might be interpreted as obscene or insulting in parts of Asia or South America. Every culture has its own way of expressing praise and insulting others. So before leaving for a country whose culture is unfamiliar, it might be worth finding out whether shaking hands and waving goodbye are appropriate ways to communicate. Language, probably the most significant component of culture, is what has allowed us to fully develop and express ourselves as human beings. And it's what distinguishes us from all other species on the planet. Although language varies from culture to culture, it's a human universal and present in all societies. It's one of the most complex, fluid, and creative symbol systems. Letters or pictograms are combined to form words, and words combined to form sentences, in an almost infinite number of possible ways. Language is the basis of symbolic culture and the primary means through which we communicate with one another. It allows us to convey complicated abstract concepts and to pass them along a culture from one generation to the next. Language helps us to conceive of the past and to plan for the future, to categorize the people, places, and things around us, and to share our experiences and perspectives on reality. In this way, the cumulative experience of a group of people, their culture, can be contained in and presented through language. Language is so important that many have argued that it shapes not only our communication, but our perception, the way that we see things as well. In the 1930s, anthropologists Edward Sapir and Benjamin Lee Worf conducted research on the impact of language on the mind. In working with the Hopi tribe in the American Southwest, the anthropologists claimed to have discovered that the Hopi had no words to distinguish the past, present, or future, and that therefore they did not see or experience time in the same way as those whose language provided such words. The result of this research was the development of what is known as the sapir whorf hypothesis, which is sometimes referred to as the principle of linguistic relativity. Their hypothesis broke from traditional understandings about language by asserting that language actually structures thought, that perception not only suggests the need for words with which to express what is perceived, but also that the words themselves help create those same perceptions. The studies by Sapir and Worf were not published until the 1950s, when they were met with competing linguistic theories. In particular, the idea that Eskimos, or Inuits as they're now called, had many more words for snow than people of Western cultures was sharply challenged, as was the notion that Hope, the Hopi had no words for future or past tense. Although there's still some disagreement about how strongly language influences thought, the ideas behind the sapir whorf hypothesis continue to influence numerous social thinkers. Language does not play a significant role in how people conduct a sense of reality and how they categorize the people, places, and things around them. For instance, the work of sociolo sociologist Evitar Zerubabel looks at how different groups, such as Jews and Arabs or Serbs and Croats, use language to construct an understanding of their heritage through what he calls social memory. In a country like the United States, where there are approximately 43 million foreign-born people who speak well over 100 different languages, there are bound to be differences in perceptual realities as a result. Does the sapir Wharf hypothesis hold true for your world? Well, let's take an example closer to home. Perhaps you've seen the 2004 movie Mean Girls, which is loosely based on a pop sociology book by Rosalind Wiseman, Queen Bees, and Wannabes, about a culture of high school girls. 
Both book and film present a social map of the cafeteria and school grounds, identifying where different groups of students, the jocks, cheerleaders, goths, preppies, skaters, nerds, hacky sack kids, easy girls, and partiers hang out. This book also includes the populars, referred to in the movie as the plastics, and the popular wannabes. You are probably aware of similar categories for distinguishing groups in Hayward. Do such classification systems influence the way you see other people? Do they lead you to identify people by type and place them into those categories? If no such labels existed, or if your school had different labels, would you still perceive your former classmates the same way? Probably not. These kinds of questions highlight how important language is to the meanings we give our everyday world.